Hi, I'm Yilmer Erkins. I'm a professor of anthropology at UC Davis. And my interest, my specialty is the field of archaeology. That is reconstructing the behaviors and the environments of long ago. I'm standing in front of Puda Creek here. Puda Creek is the creek that um, comes out of the coast range and runs through the city of Davis. Um, I think Puda Creek, though, is a great example of how much native fisheries and native waterways of California have been altered, much to the detriment of our native species of fish and other, other animals as well. So if you go just 10 kilometers upstream from here, you get to Monticello Dam, this large dam that was built to prevent flooding, but um, it also had uh, very negative effects on fishes, you know, hindering their ability to migrate up and down the river to reach the upper stre stretches of Puda Creek. And if you go just like a kilometer downstream of here, this is the point where a huge canal was excavated in the late 1800s to divert Puda Creek for south and around the city of Davis. Now, of course, those were important for managing flooding, which was a problem here in the Central Valley in places like Davis or annual floods. But it also had um, pretty bad effects on the native fish of uh, places like Puda Creek. In addition to those, um, those changes, um, the, this whole waterway here has been mined for gravel uh, many decades ago. Um, there was tons of mining for gravel. So in fact, the original elevation of the creek would have been way above my head here, but it's all been excavated, all this gravel has been excavated out. And that, of course, changed a lot of the um, beds, the gravel beds that would have been important for fishes to breed, to lay their eggs. Um, it also changed a lot of the surrounding marshland habitat that would have been important for fish. And on top of that, we get things like introduced species. So things like um, striped bass, you get uh, catfish, goldfish, all manner of fishes that have been introduced into the Central Valley. And those fishes outcompete and oftentimes are eating the native fishes of California. So all told is estimated probably about 95 to 98% of the fishes in a, today in a place like Puda Creek would be non, our non-native fish. There's only a small percentage that represent the native fishes of, um, of California. And that's a real shame. And so there's been a lot of interest in reconstructing sort of habitats for fishes to increase their, um, their ability to thrive in the Central Valley. But one of the things that we don't know since a lot of those alterations took place you know, centuries, uh, more than a century ago, we don't know a lot about the ecology of those native fishes. And so archeological sites where we have the bones of those fish, they're a tremendous resource today to understand the ecology of native fishes. So all kinds of things are recorded in the bones of fish. So their migratory habits, their dietary habits, all those things get recorded in fish bones. And so when we find those ancient fish bones, we can extract some of that information to understand the historical ecology of those different species. And so that's one of the things that my lab has been greatly involved in the last maybe five, 10 years. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on historical ecology of different species, like for example, the Sacramento perch, which is locally extirpated uh, from the, they don't exist anymore in places like Puda Creek. There are some remnant populations in other places, but. Um, they don't exist anymore in, in large parts of the Central Valley. Or the thick-tailed chub, which is completely extinct. There hasn't been a thick-tailed chub said, seen since about 1950. But we find lots of their bones in archaeological sites. And even things like salmon. Salmon are you know, greatly important. There's a lot of effort going into habitat restoration and maintenance of salmon populations. Well, it would be good to know exactly how salmon were living in the past in order to do that. So behind me is a small archaeological site in the field. Today it's a plowed field um, and there's, there's various kinds of urban urbanization projects happening in and around a place like this. But there's a, an ancestral Putwin village in the field behind me. So this would have been a place where maybe one or two families would have been living. They perhaps you can sort of envision small uh, one or two, maybe three small little houses there people walking around, maybe some dogs barking. Um, and you can imagine that then also that people would have been gathering various kinds of plant resources, so seeds, 
acorns from oak trees, um, roots of plants growing below the ground. Um, and of course they would be hunting for things like deer, uh, for um, small animals like rabbits. Mm -hmm. And in addition, they would be exploiting Puda Creek. As people would have been fishing and catching different kinds of fish, they would bring those fish back to um, their small camp here. And they would then be processing those fishes, cutting them up and, um, and eating them. And of course, depositing their bones in the archeological site behind me. So if we conducted an excavation at a site like this, we would find thousands and thousands of small fish bones. Now those fish bones then are recording information about the living condition of those fishes. So the water temperature, the salinity, the kinds of things that those fishes were eating. And we can use those fish bones today as this amazing database of information to help us understand what those native habitats were originally, lo originally like. And if we want to do habitat restoration, then we can use those bones as a source of information for what we should be restoring. And so in that regard, these archeological sites are really valuable resources for doing historical ecology. So I'm standing in the Peter Schultz osteoichthyology room where we maintain about almost a thousand different individual fishes representing about 300 different species, mostly from within California, but also many species from uh, other places around the world that are native to different regions. Each one of these um, trays, the, the different um, cabinets and the different trays, they contain those individual fishes. So we can, for example, pull one out here. Here we've got a the bones representing a Chinook salmon. This particular Chinook was collected on the Smith River in about 2006. And um, it was a whole fish. And so we have information on the size of the fish when it was caught, whether it was a male or female, um, exactly uh, what time of year it was caught and so forth. And so we use clues that are held in the bones of these fish to help us compare to archeological specimens. So here we know what the bones of a Chinook salmon look like since it's identified as Chinook. But oftentimes when we pick up a fish bone from an archeological site, we don't know exactly you know, what species it is or how big that fish was, but we can compare it to these reference samples to learn something about those fishes in the archeological record. So, once we have bones of a particular fish, again, this is one of our Chinook salmon, the native to California. This, this fish was caught in California here. Um, we can take a look at particular elements. So here are a number of the um, caudal vertebrae of the fish. Here is the mandible and the teeth. Take a look at the size of these teeth. They're huge. Uh, so you can see, you know, compared to my finger, how big the teeth on this particular salmon, uh, this particular fish were. Uh, nice hooked teeth. You would not want to get bit by this guy. Or probably one of the most special bones for archaeologists are the, oh, what are called the otoliths. The otoliths are little bones that grow in the ear of the fish that helps the fish maintain for balance in the, in the water column. They're quite small. So here's little, this is a, for a relatively large fish. These here are the otoliths. I don't, my camera's not great, so you may not be able to cut, quite make out, but I'll pull out one of these otoliths here. And the cool thing about otoliths is that they grow in sort of little, in rings um, and like trees, they sort of they accumulate one growth ring per year. And as the fish is growing, then it records information from the environment in which it's living. So for a Chinook salmon, that might include recording information about where it was born versus you know, how much time it spent out in the ocean, if any time at all. Not all salmon actually go all the way out to the ocean as we are, well, as we know. Um, uh, or it might, and it might tell us you know, how old the fish was when it returned to spawn. 
and when it was then caught by somebody and it then ended up in an archaeological site. We can also then take those, um, those elements, these different bone fragments, and look at them under the microscope. So here I can take a look at one of these otoliths and take some you know, real specific measurements under the microscope, looking at the size, the shape of the, of the otolith. Oh yeah, that's a good looking otolith. So let's say we've got a whole bunch of fish bones from an archeological site, like you see depicted here. Maybe we've got some otoliths and, and some vertebrae. How do we go about reconstructing fish behavior, fish ecology from isolated bones? Jason Mazanik, one of the project collaborators is now going to talk a little bit about fish size and how we studied Sacramento perch from the California Delta. Now, an important metric for fish health is length. Fish generally grow throughout their lifetime, and fish length is a good indicator of how much energy is available in an environment, uh, how, many, uh, how many eggs a female can produce, and general fish age. So knowing the length of Sacramento perch in their natural environments can be a good indicator of how historic and modern populations are doing by comparing one to the other. So how do we do this? Now, generally, there is an isometric relationship between length of a fish and bone size. Now, what is that science talk? What does that mean? That means generally, as a fish gets bigger, it does so proportionally. So by knowing the length of a bone, the size of bone, such as this dentary, we can estimate the size of a fish. And if we look at kind of multiple individuals of that same species, we can see that there might be a change in size of fish through time or kind of between different sites. So for this to work, we need to establish linear formulas that basically predict fish length from um, specific bone measurements. So we did this using historic specimens from the Peter D. Schultz collection um, harvested between the 60s and 70s for biological studies by um, fishery scientists. We took measurements and we then compared those measurements to the known length of those fish. And we established a predictive formula that can predict fish length off of bone measurement. We then went to our archeological collection and measured our archeological fish bones and were then able to estimate the length of archeological fish. What we found was when compared to modern specimens, these archeological specimens were much longer than their modern counterparts. This makes sense as a uh, competition with invasive species and living in small ponds and reservoirs would have limited food availability for modern populations, meaning that modern Sacramento perch or weren't able to grow as large as archaeological specimens in delta environments. So our data suggests that archaeological specimens can be used as a baseline to establish what a healthy slash natural sacramental perch population should look like. Now, it is inherently difficult studying native fish in California because the environments were so altered since so early on. But by turning to the archaeological record, we have the potential to build meaningful population baselines that can serve as be management benchmarks. That's also why comparative collections, such as this one behind me, um, acting as biological repositories are so important for future researchers. Thank you and happy Museum Day from here in snowy Wisconsin.